All right, I'm Peter Alessandria, and for the next 90 minutes, I invite you to be bigger than you think you are. If you're new here, welcome. If you've been here before, welcome back. Let us take a look at our agenda for this evening. So, as usual, we're going to start with some announcements. Then we'll have our recommended reading. We'll do the affirmation of the day. We'll have an opportunity for people to introduce themselves or share their victories for the past week. Then we'll listen to an audiobook excerpt from Chapter 5. We'll have our topic discussion, believe it or not, on Chapter 5. We'll take our break for the assignment, and we'll do some Q&A and wrap it up by 9.30. Our first announcement, as usual, is a reminder that today's workshop is being recorded and will be available on the BeBiggerToday.com website and YouTube channel within the next 48 hours. Please feel free to stop your video and mute your microphone if you do not wish to be seen nor heard on the recording. And we are running out quickly, but I do have some copies of the author signed paperback first edition of Be Bigger Than You Think You Are. Get your copy at bebiggertoday.com forward slash book. Use the code workshop20 at checkout to save 20%. While you're there, check out my book, New York Cityscapes. This is the penultimate, ultimate category-defining New York City photo book. It's a collaboration between myself and six other New York City area photographers. This is our unique take on the Big Apple, all the landmarks that you, and skyline that you guys know so well. And again, what's fascinating about this book is that each of us, even though we photograph the same skyline, the same monuments, the same landmarks, we all have our own unique take on them. So this is really cool. Check it out at my website, bebiggertoday.com forward slash bookstore. Still on sale for $16.95, and I will sign a copy of this for you as well. And making good progress on the audiobook, believe it or not. And it is available for pre-order at $9.99. It will be close to 10 hours when it is completed. It comes with a full money-back guarantee. That means if you don't love it, just let me know, and I'll send you your money back. Same is true of the author signed paperback but I know you're going to love it. Check it out at BeBiggerToday.com forward slash bookstore. And while you're there, grab yourself some merch, hats and t-shirts. Use the discount code MERCH20 at checkout at BeBiggerToday.com forward slash merch. And while you're there, check out some of my original art and photography. Each of these are original photographs, professionally framed, signed by me, and they come in a variety of sizes and shapes. Well, actually two shapes. And you can find out more with our advertisement. Peter's photos and abstract designs are uniquely beautiful, one-of-a-kind works of art. These gallery wrap canvas prints are set in a contemporary shadow box floating frame and will enhance the beauty of any home or office. Available in four different sizes, each piece is professionally framed and comes complete and ready to hang. Frames are available in your choice of black, white, or brown, and each is signed by the artist. Peter's original art and photography will make a great gift for a client, for yourself, or someone you love. Order yours today. So that was a variety of sizes, not shapes. And have I got refriger refrigerator magnets for you guys. These are my original photos on New York City Souvenir refrigerator magnets. I have a collection of a As you know, if you uh, attend this workshop, that there is a story behind the magnets as well as all the other New York City souvenirs that are using my photos. You can find out what that story is on my website. Go to the homepage at BeBiggerToday.com. Click on this link for the article I wrote for Morning Laziness about forgiveness, and you'll find out refrigerator magnets and New York City souvenirs came into being. I am available for one-on-one -on -one coaching and or corporate consulting. If you have a business or if you are a creative person and you'd like to work with me one-on-one, -on -one, I welcome that. Check out my um, uh, contact me through the website at BeBiggerToday.com 
And if you'd like me to come in and speak to your, if you have a company, you'd like me to come in and speak to your sales team, your management team, on how they can be bigger than they think they are, I'm your guy. So reach out to me through the website. We'll set that up. And finally, I have donations to help support the workshop. I'm looking for support to continue to offer the workshop at no charge and to keep it open to everyone. Suggested donation of $5 per week, $20 per month. You can send your contribution to me at paypal.me forward slash Peter Alessandria, all one word. Thank you to everybody who has sent in donations so far. I really appreciate that. And thanks to everybody else for their support. All right, so let us begin the evening with our recommended reading. And the recommended reading for tonight is Illusions, The Adventures of a Reluctant Messiah by Richard Bach. Now you may know Richard Bach as the author of Jonathan Livingston Siegel. That was a very popular book in the 70s and actually one of the first books that I read by him. And we're going to talk about that book at a, at a, in a later workshop. But for tonight, I want to bring your attention to this book because this is actually a really great book. It's a fictional, quote unquote, fictional tale of a modern day messiah, saint, whatever you want to call him, who um, doesn't want the job. He's basically uh, an advanced being. He has the power to heal. He has the power to, of mind over matter. And he doesn't want the job. And so it's a very interesting take on um, what happens when you're gifted with spiritual gifts and you don't want them. What do you do? Now, he actually wanted the job originally, um, but what happened was when people found out who he was and what he could do, they basically started coming to him and all they wanted him to do was perform miracles. That was like his only value in the world was to perform miracles for them. Nobody wanted to learn about their true spiritual nature. Nobody wanted to improve their character. Nobody wanted to learn about um, uh, you know, a, higher, a higher plane of existence. Nobody wanted to expand their consciousness. They just wanted to see this guy work miracles. And eventually it just became, it was drudgery for him. And it takes place in, in the context of middle America in probably the 1970s. Um, and what's very interesting to me is if you've read the Urantia book, which is a book I recommended a few weeks ago, uh, there is a section in the Urantia book that talks about the life of Jesus. And it's a first person, it's literally a first person account of Jesus' entire life on earth. And what, 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 one of the things that always jumped out at me about that story was that Jesus also got to a point where he also was frustrated with the multitude because none of them wanted to improve themselves. None of them wanted to expand their character. Nobody, no, none of them wanted to be better people. They just wanted him to perform miracles. And this came out at the wedding where he multiplied the fishes and the loaves. Uh, you, don't see, you don't hear about this in the Bible, but if you read the Urantia book, there's a story in there where he actually came out and kind of chastised the crowd and, and basically said, guys, look, I'm giving you the key to eternal life. I'm giving you the key to the evolution of your soul. I'm promising you perpetual abundance and happiness and communion with your Father in heaven. And all you want me to do is perform miracles. What's up with that? Anyway, I'm digressing a little bit but it reminded me of this book. So this is actually a really fun book. I found it on um, the audio book I found on YouTube. It's about three hours long. Uh, you could probably also get it on Audible if you want to do the audio book, or you can just get a copy off Amazon. Uh, I'm sure there are used copies out there in paperback. Uh, but anyway, this is a really fun book, and it really makes you think. It's a very interesting take on... Um, on the evolved soul and how we, the, the multitudes, relate to that. So I highly recommend this book. Check it out, The uh, Illusions, The Adventures of a Reluctant Messiah by Richard Bach. Okay, so let's move on to our affirmation of the day. Today's affirmation, I see myself in perfect health. 
I see myself in absolute prosperity. I see myself invigorated with life. Now, I actually didn't make this one up. I actually grabbed this from the Abraham Hicks um, website. Actually, so if you want to get daily inspiration, if you want to get an affirmation in your inbox every day, go to abraham-hicks.com and sign up for their daily affirmation. So every day you'll get a, a really cool affirmation right in your inbox. Um, so anyway, I, I, I grabbed this one from, I think it was two days ago. But the point I want to make with this, uh, so I see myself in perfect health. I see myself in absolute prosperity. I see myself invigorated with my life. Now, I keep telling you guys, we got to get excited about our lives. The, the whole point of affirmations is not to repeat a mantra over and over again and suddenly have things magically appear in our life. The purpose of the affirmation is to consciously and deliberately think thoughts and speak words that elevate our state, that put us in a higher emotional, vibrational state, a more positive state of mind, a more positive emotion. And then those positive emotions create positive actions, and positive actions lead to positive results. So if you can't get excited about your life, uh, you know, I hate to tell you, but your life is probably not going to change. I'll speak for myself. If I can't get excited about my life, then chances are pretty good my life is not going to change because I'm not going to have positive emotion. I'm not going to speak positive words and take positive actions, and I'm not going to experience positive outcomes or new or different outcomes. So this seems like, at first glance, you know, this is a little kind of pie in the sky. I see myself in perfect health. I see myself in absolute prosperity. I see myself invigorated with life. But try it on. Just for, the, just for one day, repeat this to yourself as often as you can remember to. And the other interesting thing about this is I see myself. Now, I've been talking about since day one of this workshop that how we see ourselves determines everything. All right? It's not the economy. It's not, you know, whatever pathogens are out there in, in, the, in the environment. It's not other people. It's not the government. It's not whatever we think is running our lives. We're running our lives, and it starts with our perception of ourselves. It starts with how we see ourselves. It starts with who we think we are. So I'm going to ask you this question. Who do you think you are? Do you think you have the ability to be perfectly healthy? Do you think you have the possibility of having absolute prosperity? And do you think you can be invigorated with your life? Only you can decide. I can't, I can't do that for you. I can barely do it for myself. So take charge of your life and start by shifting your emotional state, raise your vibration, become in, 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 excited about your life, become excited about the prospect of your life. That will change everything. The emotions will, f the, the, the affirmations will fuel the emotions and the emotions will fuel the new results. But if you don't do that, if I don't do that, if I walk around thinking the same negative thoughts every day, oh my God, my life sucks. Oh my God, my neighbors are a pain in the ass. Oh my God, the economy sucks. Oh my God, my back hurts. Guess what? Tomorrow is going to be the same thing, only you know what? It's going to be a little bit worse. And then the day after that, it's going to be a little bit worse. And then one day I'm going to wake up and I'm going to be like, what the hell happened? And it's because I didn't take conscious and deliberate and intentional control of my life. Remember, chapter three, true power. True power is the ability to consciously choose and or change our thoughts, feelings, words, and actions. When we do that, that's when our life changes. So there. All right. So, this is an opportunity. We're going to move on. We're going to do our introductions and victories. So, if there's somebody who is new tonight who would like to introduce themselves, this is your chance to do that. Or if you want to share a victory from the link, you can do that as well. So, just mute yourself. And what do you got? I'll share. I'll just say hello. Hi, Peter. Hi, everybody. It's Dee Dee. Can I be heard? Oh, whoops, I'm not on video. There, I want to be on video. Hi, hi, everybody. Hey, Hello. this is 
this is it feels like a victory it's not specific to the last week's training but this new um client that i have and the 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 affiliations and the networking that i'm receiving for being in the position i think it's going to be uh significant for my future uh, client base and um, just being known and being willing to claim my my gifts and my skill set and my service in a more outwardly public way so i feel really grateful about that i want to say that the illusions was my favorite book for years and years it's so funny because I didn't remember the story the way that you told it. So I think it's time for me to reread the book because uh, I love that book. I don't read, I don't like to watch movies more than once or books more than once, but that book I can read again and again. So thank you for that. Um, and we, we all got together and that was really special, precious. So I appreciate you bringing us together offline. And I had a question and it was, oh, you know, here, I realized today because I have a root, I am in need of wanting to change, you know, to really change how I see myself. I want to do that movie, that commercial, that uh, I think it's a, a software, an audio visual vision board thing. Do you know if people have ever gotten together and shared that software? That's a question to you. Okay, thanks. Glad to be here. Pass. All right, great. Thank you, Dee Dee. Yeah, so you're referring to a mind movie. So there is a, a website called mymovie.com, and uh, it's not a free service. I actually got um, an account when I did the Joe Dis Dr. Joe Dispenza workshop about a year and a half ago. He's a really big, he's actually the one that introduced me to the mind movies, although I, I, I've done vision boards and I've thought about actually putting together some kind of a video. For people who don't know, a mind movie is a visual auditory representation of your vision, of your affirmations. Um, and you use video, you use still images, you use text, and you use music to create uh, a, an audio-visual, emotionally charged, uplifting, positive uh, statement of, again, your affirmations, your vision statement, and all of that. And uh, I played mine, I think it was the third or fourth week of the workshop back in probably August. So if you guys want to go back and take a look, I'll try and figure out exactly which week it was. Um, but anyway, if you want to go to the My Movie website, I think it's like $100 for an account, but you can do as many movies as you want over the course of the year. I, I revise mine. Some people do two or three or four different movies, you know, one for their business, one for their personal life, one for their relationships. Uh, if you don't want to invest that kind of money, there may be some free apps. I mean, basically, you just need a video editing app for your computer or for your tablet or for your phone. And what you want to do is you want to find some royalty-free still images. You know, a really cool part of the Mind Movie website is they have music that's royalty-free that you can use. They have video clips. They have all the, all the stuff you need is there. And you can actually process, you could create it right on their website. Uh, but again, if you have video editing app on your phone, uh, if you have a Mac, you can use iMovie. If you're on Windows, there are, um, there's a video editing app, I believe, in, in Windows as well. Um, but what we're talking about, again, is we're just talking about reprogramming. So it's one thing to, to stand in front of the mirror and say affirmations. You guys do stand in front of the mirror and say your affirmations, don't you? It's another thing to have, you know, on your phone. I wonder if I could play it on mine. I have mine on my phone. Uh, let me play it real quick here. I don't know how much you'll be able to see or hear. Let me switch to this camera.
Yeah. This is the, oh, all right. So there you have the mind movie. Woohoo! All I can and, say is yay. So listen, listen to listen to that twice a day. See how your life changes. Um, and that you know that's the reprogramming. That's just reprogramming. That's just saying you know who do I want to be? What kind of life do I want to have? It's just taking responsibility for our our, our life. You know, it's, um, it's, it's a tool that we have. And so um, go to the My Movie website. You can, as I said, you can also probably do it if you have uh, video editing software on your computer. The My Movie website makes it so easy to do that. And you can change it. You can update it. You can do as many as you want. So um, I have to thank Dr. Joe Dispenza for that because he was the one who introduced me to that. So um, check it out. Didi, does that, I guess that answers your question. Absolutely. Thanks for the refresher. Looks yeah. like it's well worth it. Yep. So, all right, cool. I think Cynthia, you wanted to share a victory or say hi? Yes. I, I haven't signed the contract yet, but I have uh, an agreement with, um, a web designer to create a web that will allow me to do the things I want to do. <laughs> so <laughs> that's a very big victory. Thank you, Peter. You're welcome. Woohoo! Good job. So yeah, that's also, you know, spending money. This is something that I, I'm going to talk about at another time, I'm sure. But, you know, making a commitment to something and putting your money where your mouth is, that sends a pretty big message to the universe that, you know, we're ready to have something change, you know. Um, uh, and so it's, it's, a, it's a sign of commitment. It's a sign of, of intention. Um, so great. Good job, Cynthia. Who else? 
Hi, Peter. Hi, Barb. Um, I don't have a victory, but I know somebody mentioned to just kind of talk about what I was talking about last week. <clears throat> um, you know, I made the phone call. The person didn't really know what I was talking about. And, um, you know, it's going to be an ongoing thing. I really, uh, as I said, I kind of, uh, I made a big mistake in doing the uh, data entry for the end of the year tax statements. And I had no idea if I was going to how many people are going to be affected by it, but it seems like not a lot. And I have a, not a good attitude. What can I say? I'm bigger than I am because I am, I'm not, I didn't fall into a hole about it. So um, what happens is I've gotten a few of the phone calls and I've fixed it. You know, I've sent out a new uh, statement and that's it. And I just, I, what I, well, I guess what we're, I'm saying is that, I don't know what I'm saying. Um, I'm different. I'm not stressing about it. I'm not losing sleep over it. I'm taking responsibility for it. It's just different because I feel like I used to be a person that did take, if I made a mistake, I would take a responsibility. But, you know, so this is just, this is part of life, part of my life. And uh, it will pass. There's nothing I can do about it. Um, and the person that I work with who, you know, may get some of these phone calls and have, she didn't really get it and she didn't really want to get it. So whatever happens, we'll be fine. All right, good. Yeah. So I don't know, is that positive? Well, I mean, I, I, well, I think the, the big takeaway for me, well, number one, I, you know, I don't hear you beating yourself up so much, which is great. Right. That's the most important thing in my book. Okay. Screw everybody else, but just how you treat yourself, you know, how I treat myself in situations like that. Uh, number two is I hear that you're, you're willing to learn from your mistakes. And number three is you're willing to take responsibility for your part. You know, now at a certain point, you may want to have a conversation with the employer and say, is it really my responsibility to handle tax issues for the, for the church or whatever? But, um, but you're taking responsibility for your part. You're not beating yourself up and you're doing, you know, you're learning from your mistake and, and you're handling it. Yes, it, all, all of the above. So that's a victory. Woo -hoo. <laughs> I'll give you, uh, listen, I'll give you a woohoo for that. Woohoo! All right. Thanks. All right, great. Thank you, Barb. Anybody else? No. Okay, so let us continue then. So we are still on chapter five. I do see a couple more weeks at least, maybe even more than that. Um, chapter five, decision-making and the desire to feel better. Uh, and today we're going to continue on with our discussion of what it actually means to make a decision so uh, we can feel better. So we're going to play the audiobook excerpt now, and then we'll come back and start the topic discussion. So hang on for that. This is going to hurt me more than it hurts you. So far, my examples of making choices to feel better have been pretty obvious and fairly easy to digest. But we're talking about a continuum of feeling better. This may mean we're starting off on the low end of the scale, the low, low, low end of the scale. That is, we're trying to feel better in a really bad situation. The parent that screams at their child at the shopping mall may not feel good while they're doing it, but they're still doing what they do to feel better. The child may be making a scene which the parent associates with embarrassment, or the child may be acting in a way which jeopardizes their own or someone else's safety. How the parent sees themselves and by extension how they see the child, will determine how they react. If they see themselves as overwhelmed, powerless, or unable to control their child, then in an attempt to reduce their discomfort, i.e. feel better, they may lash out at the child. Now the parent isn't bad or even wrong in this situation. They're just being human. To not lash out at a child under such circumstances may require a very high level of awareness and or self-control. Yet by understanding why we do what we do, we can begin to do things better. For instance, the parent, being more aware of the true nature of the problem, can come up with a plan as to how they'll act in the future if the situation comes up again. 
in the long run, if we want to be better people and live happier lives, learning to control our emotions and consciously select our response in each situation is of vital importance. Planning things out in advance is one way to do this. And even if we don't have time to put together an advance plan, taking a pause and remembering the problem is always how we see ourselves can help change how we react in the moment. We talked about the difference between reacting and responding earlier in this book. Sometimes taking a pause and bringing some conscious awareness to what we're about to say or do may be all that's needed to achieve a more positive result. As with all our actions and reactions, a decision about what will feel better has to pass through the internal filter of who we think we are. So again, in the unruly child example, if I see myself as powerless in the face of my child's outbursts, I'm going to have one reaction. If I see myself in a more positive way, I'll have a different one. Thus, whether it's my kids, my job, or just my drive to work, it may be helpful to take some time when things are not so heated to envision myself in a new and empowered way. Am I safe? Am I loved? At the beginning of this chapter, I mentioned the two core questions we all face at various times throughout our lives. Am I safe? And am I loved? When we're talking about wanting to feel better, initially at least, it's usually on one or both of these measures. In the example of buying a new car, if the concern is our current vehicle may break down and leave us stranded, then we're trying to feel better on the safety security front. If our new car purchase is motivated by a desire to show off our improved social status, then we're trying to increase our feeling of being loved. Many of us equate feelings of love and acceptance with impressing others. I'm not saying we shouldn't buy new cars. But if our goal is to make better choices, we want to make sure we know why we're doing what we do. Being aware of the motivation behind our decision making is very important. What about when we reach the point where we actually do feel safe and loved? then the desire to feel better becomes motivated by having more fun. Once our basic safety and security needs are met, we focus on higher order needs, such as joy and self-realization. Experiencing more happiness and fulfillment becomes the impetus for why we do what we do. The body is decision maker. Returning to our discussion of addictive compulsive behaviors, I can now say I did what I did because I thought I would feel better doing it. Like many people, I use substances and behaviors to cope with uncomfortable or stressful situations. Of course, I wasn't aware of this while I was doing it. I just thought I was having a good time. Substances like drugs or alcohol have a euphoric or anesthetic effect. They increase pleasure and or lessen pain. Footnote 37. I learned recently adrenaline is one of the strongest painkillers out there, or actually in there. This explains why so many of us deal with problems by creating drama in our lives. The drama triggers adrenaline in the body, which in turn gives us a rush of energy while also mediating our physical and or emotional pain. Back to the text. This makes it easy to mistake their effects for a genuine increase in our sense of ease and well-being. As a result, for many years, especially when I was younger, I parted my way through life. Yes, there were hangovers, missed classes, and waking up in the wrong bed with the wrong people. But for the most part, I was able to let the good times roll. Eventually, however, what had started out as a good time morphed into something more unpleasant. It wasn't long before I stopped feeling better and started feeling worse. This is actually true of all addictions. What used to seem to help us feel better eventually causes us to feel worse. However, because of their habitual nature, it can take a long time to realize that the addiction is no longer working. This is usually compounded by a lot of denial, social pressure, and or physical or psychological withdrawal. Thus, it can be years before a person comes to realize the substance or behavior doesn't reduce the pain, but that it actually increases it. In particular, the body's dependency, as evidenced by withdrawal symptoms and or physical cravings, can make it even harder to realize when we've crossed over to feeling worse rather than better. When it takes years for the reality of our situation to sink in, a lot of unnecessary damage can be done to ourselves and others. The beauty and great service of recovery programs is they help us see this reality sooner rather than later. They help drive home the fact that what we think will cause us to feel better is actually causing us to feel worse. By identifying with others who suffer from the same affliction, usually through the sharing of their stories, we get to see the true effects of our choices and behaviors more quickly than we might on our own. 12-step programs are also known for the great support that is available between meetings. 
regular contact with sponsors and program friends is very helpful in avoiding the thinking that just one more drink or toke or whatever will make us feel better. For any program of recovery or rehabilitation to work, people have to see how their old choices no longer serve them, and probably never did. When speaking about addictive or compulsive behaviors, there is often an emphasis placed on the physiological effects, the bodily urges that can intensify an addiction. It's undeniable that certain substances can generate cravings. Normal hunger is a good example. Anyone who has missed a meal or two knows how powerful the desire for food can be. Yet, physical cravings and desires notwithstanding, I feel that, for me at least, it's the mind and not the body that ultimately guides all my decision-making. As I said earlier, I choose to approach this entire topic of addiction from the place that nothing and no one has the power to usurp my will. As someone who has spent a lot of time in 12-step rooms over more than 22 years, I don't write these words lightly. I also respect and honor those who hold a different opinion. Yet I choose to look at it this way. If the body was a determining factor in our behaviors, then the body would be autonomous from the mind and we would never be able to change those behaviors. Physical cravings would rule our decision-making and we would ultimately have to succumb to those bodily urges. Yet millions of people around the world have overcome one or more substance and or behavioral addictions. Yes, at one time they had intense urges to indulge in those behaviors. Yet today they are free. Is it difficult to break an addiction? For many of us, yes. Is it heartbreaking to see those who have tried and failed? Indeed. And yet for me personally, I think it's disempowering to blame cravings or allergies of the body for my plight. I know it often feels like the body is in charge, but I sincerely believe that the body follows the mind and that, as I've been saying since page one of this book, we always have the ability to change our minds. I have met many people over the years who, in overcoming their own addictions, have described it as follows. At some point, they just decided to stop. One day they knew they were done drinking or drugging or whatever. And despite being tempted at times, they've never gone back. Some continue to work recovery programs, others don't. But the point is, decisions are of the mind, not the body. Eventually, the body will follow any sincere decision of the mind. All right. So that's our audiobook excerpt for tonight. Now, there is more to this discussion. So for people who have experience with 12-step and all that, there is more. I talk more about this later in this chapter. We're going to talk about it next week or the week after. Um, And and the basic gist of it is that, for me at least, uh, I needed the help to, 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 to make a new choice in terms of my addictive compulsive behavior I did need the help of other people, of a program, and of a higher power. So uh, we'll talk more about that. But at a certain point, I made a decision, and I've seen this with other people, and it's the recognition that what we were doing was not, was not working, was not serving us. And it, I wasn't feeling better. I was feeling worse. So, but we'll talk more about that specific of it next, in the next two weeks. Uh, but I want to come back just to the idea of decision-making in general. And so one of the things that I talked about in the audiobook tonight was, <clears throat> you know, it's not always um, uh, a choice to feel. The, so, so feeling better doesn't, mean we're, doesn't necessarily mean we feel good, like in an absolute sense. Um, and sometimes, as I said in the audiobook, you know, we're starting from a really bad place, and so it's a relative kind of thing. And the decision to feel better is born out of, as with everything else in our lives, as far as I'm concerned, or as far as I can see at least, is born out of how we see ourselves in that situation. Remember, the situation is never the problem. The problem is always and only, only, always and only how I see myself in that situation. So as I change how I see myself, I change how I respond, and I have a different experience of the same situations in my life. So the concept, you know, the first concept is that feeling better is relative. So it is possible to feel better, but still not feel good. And the example, again, that I gave in the audiobook tonight was, you know, a parent that lashes out at a child. Uh, But it could be, you know, it could be a child that lashes out at a parent. Two adults lashing out. The idea 
is in that moment, we are doing what we have been conditioned to do. We've been, we, 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 we do what we've seen other people do uh, in terms of to try and grab our power back, to try and, and, and deal with the situation that's really challenging to us. And so often, we're going to talk a lot about this in chapter 6 and maybe chapter 7, we will resort to anger to, to feel safe, to take our power back or to take control of a situation. We'll use anger, we'll use sarcasm, we'll use judgment. I mean, there's actually a lot of ways that we do that. So the first thing I want to say is we're not bad or wrong for doing that. The parent that yells at the kid at the shopping mall or the kid that yells at the parent in the basement of the house for whatever reason, you know, they're not bad or wrong. We're just trying to cope with a situation that's creating stress, that's creating fear, where we feel afraid, where we feel out of control, where we are worried about our safety or somebody else's safety. And so one of my suggestions, which I've said in many different contexts, is to plan ahead. So if I'm going to the shopping mall with my, my child, in my case, my niece or my nephew, and I know that there are challenges associated with that, then take five minutes before I go to the mall and I think it through and say, okay, what happens when my five-year-old niece or nephew goes, runs off um, because he or she sees something in the storefront that's they, you know, and they, they run away, and I got the other one, and how am I going to deal with that? To have a plan, to think it through in advance. Now, the main thing we want to do is change how we see ourselves in that situation. Because if I, if I can convince myself through positive thinking <clears throat> and through positive experiences that I've had, if I can convince myself that I can handle that situation, when my nephew runs off, my five-year-old nephew runs off, I can handle that. I can figure that out. He's going to be okay. I'm going to be okay. You know, I come at it from a different place. There's not much I can do in terms of controlling the situation. There's not much I can even do in terms of controlling his behavior. But I can always change how I see myself in that situation. And if I do that in advance, before it happens, and we talked about this in the context of, uh, you know, if I have, a, uh, I have a phone call coming up with a client, and I know that this client pushes my buttons, or if I have an event, a family event that I'm going to be attending, you know, call somebody before the phone call or before the family event or before whatever the thing is that challenges you, call a friend, phone a friend, is that show still on, phone a friend? Talk it through. Come up with a plan. Role play. Ask them to be that other person and have the conversation before you have the conversation so when you have the conversation, you'll know what to say. This really works. Trust me. So, um, so again, back to the discussion for tonight. So what we want to do is be aware that when we're in that, the situations that change us, it's a natural instinct to try and cope with that situation and to do whatever is in our arsenal of coping mechanisms to better navigate the situation. What we want to do is expand our arsenal. We want to have more tools. We want to have different ways of handling the situations that challenge us. And it all starts with that reprogramming the mind which says, you know what? Reprogramming the mind which says, you know what, I can't handle this, this is going to be painful, this is going to be a mess, you know, um, it, it's not going to work out, and, I don't, and I'm not going to know what to do. When I go into a situation like that, I guarantee you the outcome is going to be worse And if I go into the situation and say, all right, I got this, I can figure this out. It may be a little challenging, you know, I may have to ask for help, I may have to you know, uh, try to accommodate certain people or situations, but I can figure this out. I'll, I'll, this is going to be okay. It's going to be okay. Really, it's going to be okay. Then I have a whole different experience, I have a whole different mindset going in, and the outcome changes as a result. 
all right? But this is about taking responsibility. See, if I think it's everybody else's job to change so I can feel better, if I think my nephew has to act in a certain way, or if he doesn't, then it's his fault that I feel the way I feel, then guess what? I'm not going to take responsibility for my part in that situation. I'm not going to make the effort to pre, pre-plan, to prepare. Because I'm, I'm honestly, what that means, we're going to talk about this in, step, in chapter 6, I'm more interested in making him wrong for who he is or whatever the situation than I am for taking responsibility and having a different outcome. There's a payoff for me to, to blaming other people for how I feel, for making other people wrong for who they are. It's not to say that other people don't have a part in those situations and the, you know, the things that, that we encounter in life. But if I truly want to have a different experience, I've got to take responsibility, and that means going into the situation, I'm going to do some preparation. I'm going to do some pre, pre-paving, some um, pre-planning. And uh, I think it was in Chapter 3 I talked about this. This is uh, setting an advance intention. And the best advance intention that we can set is, who do we want to be in that situation when the challenges come up? How do I want to see myself? How do I want to respond? How do I want to treat myself? How do I want to treat other people? Remember, I can still take care of myself. We're going to talk about this in chapter 6 and 7, but I don't have to use anger to take care of myself anymore. I don't have to use self-pity. I don't have to try to make other people feel guilty to take care of myself. I don't have to try and control and manipulate other people so I can feel safe. You know, living a bigger life, being bigger than I think I am, means doing all of that differently. And so that's what we're talking about. All right? So we'll come back to this. So feeling better is relative. It's possible to feel better but still not feel good. Now, again, we talked about this a little bit last week, but I want to come back to this because this is really important. And this is how decision-making works. So basically, we have a perception. Now, again, here's that word perception. Perception is so important in, in everything. We have a perception of a lack or a problem that creates this tension within us. All right. Now, it's not always a problem. You know, it could be things are really good, but we're, we want them to be better. So there's a lack in, you know, the excitement scale or the abundance scale, or it's okay to want a better life, all right? It's okay to want a bigger life. That's why I wrote this book. But we want to be aware of the process, how the decision-making process works within our mind. So we perceive some lack or problem, and that creates a tension within us, within our minds, within our bodies. There's this tension. Now, what we want to do is, so what happens next is, in step two, we make choices or decisions that we think will eliminate that lack or solve that problem. So we're using our cognitive facilities, we're using our mind to come up with a solution to the problem based on the perception that there is a problem or a lack that needs to be fixed or solved or relieved. But remember, the perception of the lack or the problem starts with how we see ourselves in that situation. See, again, if I'm at the mall with my five-year-old nephew, if I see myself as not being able to handle the situation, as not being able to handle him, that perception is going to create this need within me to figure out a way to handle him or to handle the situation. Whereas if I see myself that I'll be able to take care of myself, that I'll be able to keep him safe, that I will be able to figure out whatever challenges come up, I'm going to, I see myself differently, I see him differently, and I respond to the situation differently. And then in step three, we get feedback. So if the choices that we make release the tension, we feel better. That's why I say it's the desire to feel better that that motivates every choice and decision we make. We want to feel better. 
And the feeling better parts comes when the tension is released, when the problem is solved, when the lack is addressed. Now the problem is we don't always have all the information this week. We don't always have all the information to make an informed decision. There are conflicting choices, you know, that can come up. So we want to feel better on the car reliability front. So we go buy a new car. So we feel better on the car front, but we feel worse on the financial front. And then if there are other people involved, they have their own idea about what's going to feel better in that situation. So it's not always so clear cut. It's not always black and white. The point, I'm, the whole reason I'm bringing all of this up is we want to be aware going into the situation what the challenges are, how we can be better prepared, and how we can then have better outcomes and making better choices and decisions. Again, the example I gave last week is when I moved to California, I leased a very expensive, fancy, convertible European sports car that I couldn't afford, but I thought if I had that car, then I would fit in and I would feel better. I would be acceptable, socially acceptable, you know, in terms of my career, in terms of my job situation. I thought I needed that to fit in. And when I fit in, I look good. And when I look good, I feel good. And I would feel better about being acceptable, about being part of you know, fitting into the situation. But as I said, I spent a lot of money on a car I couldn't afford. It actually turned out to be a real nightmare when all was said and done. And if I had just changed how I saw myself, so I was acceptable, so I fit in, so I was okay no matter what car I drove, then I could have saved myself a lot of money and heartache. All right? It's not an argument about getting nice cars. It's okay to have a nice car. It's okay to live in a nice neighborhood. It's okay to do all that stuff, but we want to know why we're making the choices that we make so we can make better choices. Why we're making the decisions we're making so we can make better decisions. That's all this is about. But it starts with that consciousness. It starts with knowing what's motivating our choices and decisions. All right, so we've, there's this tension, this internal tension in our mind. We seek to release that tension by making a particular choice or decision. Mm -hmm. And when the tension is released, we feel better. And when the tension is not released, when the choice was not a good one, we feel worse. And again, last week we defined disappointment. We said um, disappointment is when we're expecting something to make us feel better, and it doesn't. All right. And now the last slide uh, is I've talked about this several times, and again, I mentioned this in the, um, in the audiobook tonight. As far as I'm concerned, so at the beginning of this chapter, in chapter five, I mentioned John Bradshaw and his book, I think it was Homecoming, pretty sure, and in that book, he said every child needs to know two things. They need to know that their parents are okay and that the child, that they, the child, matter to their parents. All right, so parents are okay and that and that we matter. Now the reason for this is it's survival. If, so if our parents are not okay because we're totally dependent on them, we may not survive. Likewise, if our parents don't love us, if, they, if we don't matter to them, they're not going to feed us. They're not going to take care of us. And at some level, even the, the smallest infant knows that. And what we do is and we talked about this, I'm not going to go into it tonight, but what we do is we begin to compensate for parents who are not okay or for situations where we're not loved, where, we're not, where we don't matter, where we're not taken care of properly. Now, the reason I'm bringing all that up is, for me, that relates to these two core questions. And as far as I'm concerned, again, I see it in myself, but I see it in other people as well, these two questions come up over and over again in the course of our lifetime, uh, could almost be on a daily basis in some cases, and they run our lives. This question of, am I safe? I mean, look at what's going on in the world right now. How many people are wondering if they're safe, wondering if they're gonna be okay? And the second question, am I loved? Am I lovable? Am I worthy? Am I good enough to be loved? 
All right, so these are the core questions that we carry throughout our lives. And these questions are usually the questions that we're trying to feel better on. So if I feel unsafe, to feel more safe, to feel better on the parameter of safety, I'm going to make choices and decisions that I think will increase my sense of safety, that will make me safer. Likewise, if this question, if I question whether or not I'm loved, whether or not I'm lovable, whether or not I'm good enough to be loved, whether or not I'm worthy, if that question is going, and, and normally these questions are not, they're subconscious, they're not, not, we're not walking around with this in the front of our, our mind, it's, it's kind of buried back there. If I'm walking around with this question, am I lovable? Not really even sure that that's a question, but it just seems to be running my life. I'm going to make choices and decisions that I think are going to make me feel better by making me feel more lovable, making me feel more worthy. But what I don't know is I'm going to look outside myself for that. So I'm going to find people who tell me I'm good and valuable and worthy. People who tell me they love me. But it's the old story. If I don't love myself, I can't really experience love from another person. So I have to decide for myself that I'm lovable. I have to decide for myself that I'm worth being loved. And then I'm not going to look outside of me. I'm not going to make choices and decisions to feel better, to feel more lovable by going outside and, uh, of myself and getting into codependent relationships with, with bosses, with girlfriends, with teachers, you know, with friends, you know, where I'm constantly trying to do people-pleasing so they'll like me. If only they like me, then I'll feel okay, I'll feel better because I'll feel lovable. So I'll be people-pleasing and I'll say yes to something when I really want to say no to it. And I'll, I'll, you know, I'll make somebody else's opinion of me more important than my opinion of myself. All the codependent things that I used to do in my relationships all so I could feel more lovable and I could feel better. It's like, oh, okay. But that never worked because it's nobody else's job to tell me I'm lovable. It's nobody else's job to love me. I talk about that all night. So what happens is, um, and again, it just comes back to our perception of ourselves. So how do I see myself? If I see myself as unlovable, then I'm going to make choices and decisions that are going to make, that hopefully are going to make me feel better, but it never works. And the reason is our perceptions are not always accurate. See, this idea that I have about myself that says I'm not lovable, that's not an accurate perception. That was the perception, that was the conclusion, that was the idea that I formed about myself as a six-year-old based on something crazy that was going on that I had no control over, that I didn't understand, but because I'm a child, I'm egocentric, I make everything about me, it must be my fault. That must mean I'm a bad person because they're angry, they're upset, they're not happy, and they're telling me it's my fault and it must be my fault. So I come to this conclusion that there's something about me that's not lovable, that makes me not good enough, that makes me unworthy. That's the faulty perception. Then the faulty perception gives rise to the question, am I lovable? Am I safe? Can I take care of myself? Am I powerful? And I look for ways to prove to myself that I'm powerful, but they're not healthy ways, they're not functional ways, they're dysfunctional ways. As I change how I see myself, I change how I see the world. And those questions, again, we talked about this in chapter four, we talked about the difference between fear and caution. So it doesn't mean we throw safety out the window. It doesn't mean we go sit in the middle of the street and pretend that we're not gonna get run over by a truck. It's not that we don't use common sense. I'm not saying any of that. We use common sense. We take precautions. We act like a reasonable person in the world. But we don't have to go to that extreme of where, you know, the fear takes over. Because when fear takes over, we don't make good choices and decisions. At least I don't. When the fear takes over, when the self-loathing takes over, when the feelings of not good enough take over, I don't make good choices and decisions in terms of my friends or my girlfriends or my, you know, whoever I'm interacting with. 
right? When my perception of myself says I'm not good enough, I'm not worthy. I'm going to look for all kinds of ways to compensate. I'm going to make really bad choices and decisions. And, you know, welcome to my life. All right. So let's preview. We're way over time here for our break. Let's preview the um, assignment for tonight, the exercise for tonight. Give three examples of where doing something out of a desire to feel better eventually led you to feel worse. All right. And again, the example that I gave tonight in the audiobook was from, you know, addictions, you know, alcohol, uh, spending money. You know, I, I got to say, for a long time, I spent money to feel better. I used credit cards, you know, as a way to, to food alter. And uh, I always felt worse afterwards. And it was compulsive and it was not conscious. And, you know, obviously drugs and alcohol feels better in the moment sometimes, uh, but it always feels worse afterwards. So you don't have to talk about, you know, just, it could be, it, it just could be, you know, I purchased um, clothing or whatever, you know, blouse or jacket or sweater, and I thought it would, you know, I would feel better and I ended up feeling worse. Actually, I don't know if that's a good example. You guys decide. So here's the assignment. What we're going to do is take our break, five-minute break, and then when we come back, we'll work on the assignment.
All right, so we're back. So um, we're going to look at the assignment again in a minute. I want to hear what you guys have to say. And I just want to re-emphasize again that, you know, this, there's nothing wrong with wanting to feel better. There's nothing wrong with wanting to feel good. I'm just suggesting that maybe there are, are better ways, more functional, more effective ways to achieve that. But we have to be conscious. We've got to be present. We've got to know what we're up against. The other thing I want to say is, and I think we'll talk about this next week, even when I'm acting out in my addictions, even when I'm, I'm making really bad choices, even when I'm making really self-destructive choices, number one, I'm still choosing, and number two, that doesn't make me a bad person. I, I, in my own life, and I've seen this in other people, I use the addiction to beat myself up, to hate myself, to make myself wrong. I'm not talking about that. All right? It's not, you know, I wasn't bad. I wasn't even wrong. I was just being human. I was just doing what I thought I had to do to cope, to survive, to soothe, you know? Um, and the great thing about a 12-step program is you learn how to, when, you know, when I injure myself or another, I learn how to make an amends, take responsibility. Um, so none of this is about making ourselves wrong for wanting to feel better or for making choices that we might not otherwise make if we were, you know, a little more sane in our decision making. All right, so I want to hear what you guys have to say. Again, this is the uh, assignment for the question. Give three examples of where uh, doing something out of a desire to feel better eventually led you to feel worse, or whatever you want to say on the topic. So who wants to kick us off? Unmute yourself. Unmute your bad selves. Bad as in Michael Jackson bad. I can speak to that. Um, Great. You're up, Cynthia. Assignment. I, I have several examples. One, um, one is that I drank and uh, a lot at one point in my life because it made me feel better. Another thing I did was I ate a lot. I ate things like um, huge containers, those big bowls of popcorn with butter and um and I loved macaroni and cheese, the blue box kind. And uh, it would say four portions and the popcorn would be multiple portions. And I didn't care. It was mine. All of it was mine. So the effects were not good. The effects were not good with either of those choices. Um, fortunately, I've changed my ways with both of them some years ago, many years ago on one, one hand. Um, and more recently, the things, you know, like wanting to, um, wanting to fix things with another person and striving to do that and striving to do that and striving to do that and realizing this is a personality that is like mine. And a lot of times I don't do well in those situations. So to continue in the circumstance would not be wise. Um, but I wanted what I wanted. <laughs> Consequently, I stayed longer than I ought to have. So um, those, those are things that I thought they'd make me feel better, but ultimately they didn't make me feel better at all. Thank you. Felt worse. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's the way it works, you know, and if we're not aware of it, it, it doesn't register and, and we, it becomes habit, it becomes conditioned. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, so substances, uh, obviously behaviors. Uh, it was interesting what you said in relation to other people. One thing that I learned about myself when I first got involved in Codependence Anonymous many years ago was um, I tried to fix other people so I could feel better. It wasn't really, ostensibly, I was trying to help them. I was trying to make their lives better. But I was doing it for me. Because if I could solve their problems and relieve their pain, 
I felt valuable, I felt worthy, I felt important, but most of all I felt powerful. And for somebody who perceives himself as powerless and or unlovable, anything I could do to feel powerful in the world, it gave me that hit and I thought I would feel better. But eventually it always went to shit and I always felt worse. You know, and it just created problems in the relationship, you know, all of that. So um, I just remembered that as you shared that. So great. Thank you, Cynthia. You want to say anything else about all that? Thank you. Okay, you're good. Who else? Well, I'm going to talk about it, but something came to mind where I think you remember this. I wanted to be super grandma. I wanted to be super grandma. I wanted to be the absolute best. I did everything. I bought them everything. I did everything. And it really crashed down on me. <laughs> so we won't get into why, you know, but it didn't make me feel better. Um, as a matter of fact, it caused a lot of problems. And now, after all that, and it takes a long time to heal that, um, I think I am super grandma in their eyes. And I don't, you know, I don't have to, I can just be me. So, because I've changed. So that was something, but I think you remember that. And, and that's what everybody's talking about. I mean, that super grandma, that do everything, do everything. And then eventually it got thrown back at me like, why are you doing everything? Why are you this? Why? And it was like, that's, that's a terrible feeling. And I'm sure it happens to a lot of people, like you said. Um, I was certainly doing it. I was doing it for myself. I was doing it for the wrong reason. And now I can just be a great grandma, not a great grandma, a good grandma, a super grandma. And, and, and they're fine with that. So that's my take on it. Great. And I would say this, I would say you're a super grandma in your mind. Yes. And that's the most important mind to be the super grandma in because you, you can't control what they think about you. No, but when you go back there and you know, that's what you're doing with this. We go back most of the time, we're going back to what we did. Your thing with California, the car was quite a long time ago. And this was a long time ago for me. Um, yeah, you go back and you're different, you know, um, it's not painful. It's just that we didn't know what we know now. Exactly. And that's what you said. I know. So now yeah. we know. Now we know. So now we know. But I will still suggest to you that if you're super grandma in your mind, then you got it made. Okay. Right? Because yes. you don't have any control. We have no control over what people think of us. Instead, in fact, what I said a few weeks ago was what other people think of us is none of our business. And I get to choose my thoughts, my feelings, my words, and my actions, and I'm powerless over other people's thoughts, feelings, words, and actions. So they, right. they may love me, they may hate me. You know, there are people who, who think I'm a great photographer. There are people who think I suck as a photographer. <laughs> there are people okay. who, who love my book. There are people who don't love my book. You know, got no, I got no control over any of that. The only thing I have control over, and I'm, and I'm using the, the word control, you know, some people have negative connotations. I don't think control is a bad word when we're using it for the right purpose, but I'll change it. I have power. I have power over how I see myself. I have power over who I think I am. And I am powerless over what other people think of me. And I think just right now, when I was thinking about it, I had done that before many times in my life. I threw everything in. I wanted to be the best, whatever. And it never worked out. And now I can say why, <laughs> you know, so I know, I know better now, but many times in the disappointment or the fall is really, uh, you know, it's terrible, but there's strength in that, I guess, because you pick yourself back up and you're okay. Well, and for me, I, you know, I learned some valuable lessons in all that. Mm. I relate to what you're saying. I wanted, when I, one of the first jobs I had in LA in the entertainment business, I'll never forget this. Um, I was, I don't know how much I want to talk about it. I, so I was, I had this job as a, an attorney with a, a production company <clears throat> and I was going to prove to the, the CEO, the boss of the company, how good I was what a good employee I was and how smart I was and what a valuable asset I was to the company. 
And so I, I created this report and I did all this work and I created, now this was back in the nineties when making color, color copies were expensive. And I made this, this booklet for him and I had all this information and color and you know, I put so much work into it and, uh, and I handed it to him and he was just like, what are you doing? Why did you do this? I didn't ask you to do this. I don't want you to do this. Look at all the money you wasted on color copies. <laughs> and I was like, it just rocked my world. Yeah. And I was trying to feel better about yes. myself. I was trying to feel more valuable, more worthy, you know, and I went out of my way and I did something that he didn't want me to do. He didn't think it was important or helpful. And I'll never forget that. And it really, it was like, oh, so there's something else going on here. I'm making choices and decisions from some frame of reference that he doesn't share and that apparently is not serving me or him. So that was really interesting. So I relate. Okay. All right. Thanks. All right. Great. Thank you, Barb. Who else? Got a few more. Sorry, Peter. One more thing. Um, and that we don't ever do that again, right? We will never do that again because we're different. <laughs> We've changed. Yeah, I mean, well, but yeah. yeah, I mean, I, you know, it, it, it can creep up in, in subtle ways though, you know, it's like, um, I never did that again, but I have done other things where I was trying to feel, feel better about myself as, you know, more, more valuable, more worthy, more smart or more whatever. So it comes up in different ways. If I had just changed how I saw myself, if I had just been aware enough to say, oh, wait a second. So I'm trying to prove myself when I don't really have to prove myself. I'm trying to impress somebody and that's not really serving me or him. If I had that kind of awareness, then I could make a different choice in the moment. And, and I have more of that awareness now, but it still comes up, you know? I mean, this is, uh, it's work, it's work for me. But you're right. I mean, I, I don't do that. I actually don't do any of that anymore. Um, but this, this was a long time ago. So I've had a chance to work through some of the, the, the uh, nuanced versions of that. Um, so yeah, I don't, I, I, you know, eventually we don't do it. You're right. We don't do it as much. All right, great. Thanks, Barb. Who else? I'll just take a quick share. Go ahead, Didi. Okay, great. Thanks. So, um, I so to mood alter in the past, I used to um, like to go shopping. <laughs> I like that we have these great stores that have um, you know kind of higher end stuff at a discount, and so I somehow I always thought um, you know getting treasures, getting things at a really great price uh, was a good thing. The problem is when. Um, when moderation isn't part of the equation and it's just a, uh, uh, so for me, you know, I'm this constant struggle of, gosh, I really wish I was a minimalist. And then I get this thrill of, um, you know, of the material thing, the shiny object um, and acquiring things at a deal. So I'm stuck between these two worlds of wishing I could just be super simple, super streamlined, super straightforward. And then having this, um, I don't know what it is. It's like a crazy quirk of, of being an accumulator, a treasure hunter, a, uh, oh, I, you know, wouldn't that be useful or pretty or, you know, shiny object. And then I spent a lot of time. So that's one thing. Spent a lot of time rehabilitating some, uh, my home and property. And really, you know, 10 years later, looking at the market, really, really what it was probably was a teardown. And I should have just slapped some, some drywall and rented it out and, you know, waited and sold it for the land. I don't know. Um, you know, and I'm exaggerating a little bit because it is, it does, it does provide shelter. And yeah, I put in the high-end cabinets you know I put in the high-end cabinets and the granite in a tear down who knew you know it's like trying to be a contractor when you know nothing about this stuff 
the best thing I did was I turned my backyard into a thousand square foot organic garden. But guess what? It's out there starting to grow and I better pull the weeds or it's going to be another, oh, it was a great idea, but turn, turned on me. Anyway, thanks for smiling. I'm glad to be here. I'll get, hopefully hear from other people pass. All right, great. Thank you, Didi. Yeah, you know, spending money to feel better. I mentioned that earlier. And um, look, there's nothing wrong with wanting nice things. There's nothing wrong with having things. And listen, I love a deal as much as the next person. You know, I mean, I, 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 I feel that um, hit when I feel like I got something for a good price. There's nothing wrong with any of this. But just be conscious of why we're doing what we're doing and then ask the question, is there another way to achieve that feeling? Is there another way to approach the problem? Is there another way to experience feeling better where I don't have to go out and lease a, a, you know, a car I can't afford or I don't have to, you know, whatever I do because I think it's going to make me feel better. But it doesn't mean we can't have things. It doesn't mean we can't have a nice house, a nice life, a nice car. It's not saying any of that. It's just being more conscious and deliberate in our decision-making process. And until we know what's motivating those choices and decisions, we can't make better ones. All right, great. Thank you, Didi. Looks like, Judy, you want to go? You revving up there? Sure. Hi, everybody. Thanks for all your shares tonight. Um, well, I mean, number one for me was food because I'm a food addict. And, um, you know, that was a double-edged sword because, um, you know, as I grew and grew to 288 pounds. Um, you know, my health became compromised and yet, you know, I couldn't stop because I wanted that fix, you know, the immediate relief, you know, so that's certainly where I, you know, felt better, but didn't feel good about it, you know, so to speak. And the other thing I think about is um, I can think of which <laughs> two relates about food because my life, a lot of it related about food because I love to feed people is um, having, you know, like putting on a big barbecue or putting on big dinners. And, you know, meanwhile, I would like bust my butt, you know, and I'd be exhausted, couldn't enjoy the occasion spent tons of money. I happen to keep kosher and nobody else does. So I can't allow them to bring me anything. And um, I mean, that's an example, you know, looking for love in the wrong places, so to speak, is how I see it. So those are like two things that jump out in my mind. So, so, so can I ask you if you, you can answer if you want, you don't have to. What, so what's different now? What, I, don't, I, mean, I don't feed people that way. And especially, especially now, because I'm much, I'm much more on a high carb, uh, high fat, low carb diet food plan. And um, cause I, I can certainly feed people um, abstinently with me, but I would make side dishes for them. And um, I don't even want to do that today because I don't think it's so healthy for them. So um, I, I'm a min I've become a minimalist. I mean, I still have things in my freezer for years, literally years with sugar because that never goes bad. And I don't know if you know, but sugar things don't freeze really. They just kind of stay there. And um, so I've been able to give desserts, you know, to my daughter-in-law and my son-in-law because they're the only two people that eat it. Um, and, um, you know, I, I holidays, I mean, I used to have 30 people and now you know, maybe there's six of us, you know, and the kid, my kids basically, and their kids, you know, their babies. So I've really become a minimalist. And in some ways, in some ways I feel a little badly about that because it was the only time the family really got together because they wanted my food. That's what it all came down to. They didn't care about the holiday. They just wanted to be fed. You know, I mean, I got a lot of joy in feeding people. But I don't today, you know, because I know what it's doing to their bodies. It's damaging them. So I don't feel real, you know, real comfortable with it anymore. So it, feel, it feels worse. You're aware that making that choice or decision leads to you feeling worse rather than better. Right. So why would I do that today? There you go. I mean, I mean, before I would do it, you know, but not today. 
because you know, right. That's, so that's growth. I mean, you know, I, I have much more self awareness of what my motives are, and I'm yes. certainly not perfect. But you know, at least in those two areas, I know that I've really changed. You know, and I guess the other thing is, which a flip side thing is. Um, Prior to COVID, I swam five days a week, but I did that because of my body, you know, I mean, to take care, because I have a back injury to take care of myself. Now I do it three days a week. I don't like doing that. I mean, it's, I do not enjoy getting up in this weather with the snow and all that and going to the pool three days a week. And it means to do all my exercises that because I have a knee injury right now, you know, things I, I literally get up like at 530 in the morning and leave for the pool at 805. Okay. And then I don't return till close to 10. So I mean, that's like a whole to me, that's like the whole day is wasted, but it's taking care of me, you know, like I accept it as that. So that's kind of the flip side of it, I guess, you know, because I don't like it. Um, I can't, I mean, I'm glad I do it. I, I like when I'm done, but the process is tough, really tough. All right, good. I get it. Good. Thank you for sharing all that. Very good. Anybody else? We only got it actually over time, but anybody else want to share about any of this? Have anything to say about any of what we covered? All right, so we'll play the song three and a half minutes, come back for our final goodbyes, and we'll wrap it up. All right, guys, so that's it. We've got another week under the belt. We're um, chugging along. As I said, we're going to be working on Chapter 5 for the next couple, couple more weeks at least. Chapter 6 is going to be a lot of fun, and then Chapter 7 is the big one. So, um, but we're, we're making good progress. Um, please check out the Big Bigger Today YouTube channel. Videos. What happens on YouTube is when a video gets liked, then the YouTube algorithm moves it up and shares it with other people, necessarily subscribers or whatever. But so the point is, the more likes we get on the videos, the more people see them. The more people that see them, the more we have an opportunity to bring to to share the message and bring new people in. Um, and I think that's it. Anybody want to say anything before we go? It's DD. I got a set of Peter's magnets for one of my clients who's from New York. They're absolutely breathtakingly beautiful, really high quality, heavy, lovely. She's going to love them. Thank you. Thank you, DD. Yeah, they're good refrigerator magnets. I bought, I bought some refrigerator magnets that sucked. I mean, they, they had no... The, the magnets were tiny. They were awful. These things, they'll hold whatever you put up there, they'll hold it up there on the refrigerator. Lynn, did you want to say something? Uh, I want to say hi. And if it's um, some um, Sunday or Saturday, you're going to uh, make meeting like um, last weekend. Don't forget me this time. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't know how that happened, Lynn. I'm so oh, sorry. Oh, I was teasing you. The joke. It's okay. I, um, I just realized that's why that's why I messaged you. I realized yeah. after the fact you were not on that email, and I didn't. I didn't actually have. I have two. E so you're on one email list, but you weren't on that one. So now you're on both. So so. Yeah, it's okay. I'm teasing you. I think we'll. I think we will do uh, a hangout. Um, you know, maybe, maybe once a month, we'll do something like that. So we'll see, we, we'll do one, we'll definitely do one next month. So that'll yeah, be an opportunity for, for whoever wasn't here on Sunday, I think it was Sunday, Saturday, Sunday. Uh, we just did one hour where there was no agenda. It was just people talking, sharing, getting to know each other, that kind of thing. And uh, it actually ended up being an hour and a half, I think. And it was really nice. So and it's not recorded, so if you don't want, you know, so you don't have to worry about if your camera's on or whatever, so and all that. So I'll let you know, Lynn. I'll let everybody yeah, know. Yeah, thank you. It's okay. I was teasing you. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Peter. Thank you. Anybody else? No, just saying good night, Peter. Thank you. All right. Good, good night, night Peter. Thank you. 
Good night, guys. Have a great week. Remember, be bigger than you think you are today and every day. I want to hear next week about all your victories. And um, yeah, we'll carry on. Have a good week. Thank you.